Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so first off, I want to say thanks for having me here. I was really uh, excited to uh, come in and be at this conference. Um, I feel like, uh, for me, Alice Obscura has like a special relationship with archivists, librarians, preservationists. They're often the people who hold the keys to like some of the greatest spaces uh, in our country and the world. So I'm really excited to be here with you guys. Also, like I live in a sort of totally, I live in a media world, uh, an internet world, and like many of you know how to actually like repair a fiberglass dinosaur or uh, do other kinds of actual uh, work, uh, real preservation work, which is really exciting to talk to you guys about. So thank you for having me. I'm um, a fan of what all of you do. So like I said, my talk is gonna be a little bit outside of the uh, standard set of talks you're hearing. It's gonna go a little broader. It's gonna talk more about kind of the general travel trends um, that I see going on and the way this will affect uh, preservation work. I'll tell you a little bit about myself and how Atlas Obscura came to exist. And then at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about maybe some methods or frameworks that you might use uh, for uh, getting people interested in a preservation project, since that's sort of my area of expertise is media, communication, that kind of stuff. So hopefully there'll be some interesting parts in there. So if you wanna get the, oh, I think I can do it from here. Uh, yes. If you wanna send that up, I can. Yes, it should show up momentarily. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, okay, so uh, first a little bit about myself and what Atlas Obscura is. So uh, I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and it was a great town to uh, grow up in. Uh, and as a kid, my family would take me on these like enormous Midwestern-style road trips, which were like, you know, it's like six hours between each stop. Uh, and when I was about 12, we went on a particular trip that left a really lasting impression on me. Uh, so we went to a place, and we, on these trips we'd go to sort of these classic roadside stops. We'd go to, uh, you know, the Corn Palace or Wall Drug. But the place that uh, affected me most was a place called the House on the Rock in Spring Green, Wisconsin. Do you, can, can I, uh, I saw a couple of recognition. Okay, yeah, so if you are familiar with this, especially if you've been there, you may sort of understand what I'm talking about. It's hard to explain to people, but to give you a kind of a sampling of what this place is, um, it, it's built around this kind of mythology, which is almost definitely all false. The guy who created the mythology, Fred Smith, who's also an outsider artist, uh, won the world's champion lying competition. So it's like comes from questionable sources. Anyway, but the mythology is that this was built as a rebuke to Frank Lloyd Wright, that um, the architect wanted to work for him, uh, Alex Jordan Jr. and he went out there and Frank Lloyd Wright said, I wouldn't hire you to build a cheese crater or a chicken coop. And he went home and he said, I'm gonna build my own Frank Lloyd Wright house. And so he built this, uh, and you can see this coming a mile away, a sort of Frank Lloyd wrong, if you will. Uh, so there's this house, but then this other thing starts happening. He starts gathering collections, buying things, actually working with a bunch of local artists. They didn't think of themselves as a collective of artists, but it's effectively what they were. They started to build these other parts of the house. It takes about six hours to walk through, and inside contains the world's largest carousel, the world's most diverse collection of carousel animals, a giant hallway that uh, looks like it goes on forever and is actually like a huge, unsupported uh, you know, point over the forest, uh, and a sculpture of a squid fighting a whale that's the size of the Statue of Liberty. These are like a, just a few things that are in this house. And as a 12-year-old, my mind sort of slowly melted out of my ears. And I thought, how is this possible? And I think that is the moment that I sort of set on this direction. Um, so I co-founded Atlas Obscura with my partner, Josh uh, Foer, in 2009. And we consider our sort of reason to exist uh, to help people experience a sense of wonder and curiosity, that same sort of magical feeling uh, that I had when I visited the House on the Rock. And we do that in a few different ways now. Um, and it started out entirely as a passion project. We like didn't have a business plan, we just figured that I was gonna go live in Eastern Europe and there wasn't a good travel resource for the kind of stuff that we both cared about seeing. 
And so we thought, let's make a place, a repository, where we could put the things we knew about and other people could submit the things that they knew about that would be open sort of for everyone to help build this. So today we do a number of things. We uh, run, uh, let's see, if I want to make a video play, what do I do? Um, well, it actually isn't necessary to make these play. Anyway, okay, so we run uh, events. We have event chapters all over the country, so, and they do various types of things. Um, we, this is an event we had at the Explorers Club where it was a sleepover, and we were able to take out the collection and look at different things. Actually, do you know how I can make these little videos play? They should autoplay. I'm not sure on the, on, or is there audio? Uh, no, there's no audio. No. But let's... Okay, that's all right. So anyway, so the other things you do, you can't really see this, but up there at the very top of this, uh, we also take people on international trips. So this is a trip we took to Bulgaria to a place called uh, Bazludza, which is actually a place in desperate need of preservation. It might be the world's greatest abandoned communist monument. It is this gigantic uh, saucer-shaped concrete building uh, that was abandoned in the 90s and has slowly been falling into disrepair. So we group, took a group of about 15 people there. We wrote this book, um, and like as was stated, we have a kid's book coming out uh, at the end of this year that I'm really excited about. It's sort of 8 to 12, uh, and hopefully gets a young generation excited about exploring. And uh, the thing that sort of is at the core of this is that each month, uh, people come to the site and they not, you know, some people just come, they're planning a trip, they're interested, they come, and some of them say, oh, you know what, there's this place that I grew up and it was like a mile away from my house and this belongs in the Atlas Obscura. The people who sort of recognize what this is about uh, help build the site. So that's at the core of what we do and it creates this database of places. Um, so what, if you're unfamiliar with Atlas, um, what are these places? Well, uh, there's a f I'm gonna give a few examples that gives a good set of of what we do. So like the Eiffel Tower, obviously not a good match, but the tiny secret apartment that is at the top of the Eiffel Tower where Gustav, Gustav Eiffel would take luminaries like uh, Thomas Edison and they would have tea and look out over Paris. That's a good example. Sometimes these places are kind of hiding in plain sight. Uh, this is a place called the Kesho Chalk. I'm gonna try and make this play one more time. Anyway, so this is a giant uh, suspension bridge in Peru, and it's called the Quechua Chaca Bridge, or sometimes it's called the Last Incan Bridge. And the reason it's called this is because it is uh, basically a functional piece of the Inc Incan highway system. It's a giant uh, suspension bridge that is woven out of grass each year. Every year they have to take it down because it slowly rots in the elements and the four villages come together and they cut down all of this grass, it's basically like hay, and they pound it with a, a rock and you wet it down, you turn it into kind of a twine, and you weave that into larger ropes, and ultimately they create this unbelievable suspension bridge. And sort of the, besides just being this engineering marvel, the other thing that's really incredible about it is it's being uh, been remade this way for hundreds and hundreds of years. It is today made and cared for exactly as it was during the Incan Empire. It is still a functional piece of essentially Incan infrastructure. Um, so this is an, an incredible place that's very special to me. I wish you could see it. It's quite terrifying looking. Um, but you'll have to imagine it sort of really swaying, you know, over a gorge. Uh, this is a place called the Gates of Hell in Dervize, Turkmenistan. So it looks a little bit like a, a natural phenomenon, like perhaps a you know, volcanic crater. Uh, this is actually the result of an industrial accident. So in the 1970s, uh, Russian uh, petroleum uh, mining company uh, was searching across Turkmenistan for places to drill for natural gas. And they found it. There's huge pockets of it uh, under the desert. So they set up their rig here. And they punched through the crust and the entire rig fell in, creating this gigantic hole. Uh, and they had a sort of a secondary problem, which is that leaking from this hole was deadly natural gas, uh, explosive natural gas. So they did the thing that I think they thought was sensible. They lit the hole on fire. 
Uh, they thought it would burn probably for a few weeks or a few months. It has been on fire for 45 years. You can see it on uh, Google Maps. It's like a little red dot in the middle of the desert. Uh, and so this is uh, a good example of an Alice Obscura location. Uh, this is another one that I like because it's actually in a very touristed area, but I think very few people realize that it's there. So this is around the corner. This is in Florence, Italy. It's around the corner from uh, the Uffizi Museum where there's always a line of like a four hour long line of bedraggled tourists sort of sweating in the uh, summer heat waiting to get in. But if they went around the block, they'd find uh, the history, uh, the Museum of the History of Science in Florence. And in this museum, among the armillary spheres and these giant telescopes, there's a tiny human fragment. This is Galileo's middle finger. And it was uh, taken, uh, snapped off of his uh, body about 100 years after he died by an admirer, by someone who wanted to venerate him you know, the same way you might venerate a saint. And it kind of floated around for a while. And eventually, the History of Science Museum gathered and sits in this little glass egg. And the question you sort of have to ask yourself is, uh, Galileo was a believer. He believed in, um, you know, he was not, as far as his heresy, he actually believed in God and he saw the beauty of God in mathematics and science. So maybe this is pointing up to the heavens. On the other hand, he was put on house arrest for 20 years by the church, so maybe it's pointing to some other part of Italy. It's hard to say. That's for the viewer to decide. Um, this is an example of one that got, uh, a place that got submitted within the first couple of months of, of Alice Obscura starting, and I think was a real crystallizing moment for me about what this could be and its sort of possibilities. So this is uh, a place uh, in Cherrapunji, India, which is one of the wettest regions in the world. They get more rainfall than almost anywhere else. And it made a real challenge, uh, which is that it, you couldn't really build infrastructure. Even you know, stuff built out of wood would just wash away. Um, so this was the kind of incredible engineering solution that was devised hundreds of years ago. Uh, these are the living root bridges of Cherrapunji, India. So what, what the solution was, was to take these two, the roots of two uh, basically rubber trees, graft them together over a period of about 15 years, and they slowly grow together, and they intertwine, and uh, at the end of that time, they become strong enough for foot traffic, and over the years, they only get stronger and stronger. Uh, and when this was submitted to the site uh, in 2009, there was almost nothing about these on the internet. We actually had a lot of trouble finding kind of supporting uh, material on these because someone wrote in and basically said, I run a small bed and breakfast here. There are these incredible living root bridges. No one knows they're here and they're falling into disrepair. They're basically being replaced by uh, quick to put up steel cable bridges. I'm worried these are gonna disappear. Uh, I'm really happy to say that sort of since this time, they've become much more well-known. They were featured on uh, BBC uh, Planet Earth, and uh, now they're, they have a really sustainable tourism industry built up around them. And in fact, they are undertaking building a new uh, route bridge, a new double-decker route bridge like this um, that should be ready in you know, about 15 years. Uh, it, one of the interesting things to note about this is the reason that this is a double decker, the, the reason for that second level is because that is where the river goes during the rainy season. So the whole bottom level just gets completely submerged um, and is fine for it. So this is, it's a, an incredible place. Uh, so why should this, this is sort of, that's what Alice Obscura does, but how does this uh, affect, you know, the work of preservationists focused on uh, American locations? So uh, let me sort of walk through why I think this matters. So in doing this work, I've sort of gotten a, a sense of what's going on in the larger like tourism landscape. And tourism is, um, is changing, and, and it's, it's changing very quickly. The motivating factor for most tourists these days is about having sort of unique, meaningful experiences. That's becoming a more and more important, a more and more important part of, of travel. And travelers have a, you know, they have, everyone has their phone in their pocket. You have a thousand different sites you can go to. I mean, it can be honestly overwhelming, but there's just a glut of information uh, uh, out there. And people are seeking these sort of unique experiences wherever they go. Um, but interestingly, uh, and I would say, you know, this is, this is sort of becoming the fundamental, like, unit of travel, these kinds of, of um, experiences and kinds of stories that people can bring back. I think, you know, this is one of the reasons that sort of travel agencies have 
suffered is because people aren't happy to get given the same trip you know that 20 other people had for them for the most part um, but one of the interesting things is that most people aren't actually traveling the world like domestic travel still makes up 85 percent of, of US vacations and road trips have been increasing uh, over the last couple of years so it creates this kind of interesting paradox you have these hyper informed travelers who are wanting unique shareable experiences um, and I don't actually think sometimes this gets like laid at the feet of Millennials only I actually don't think that's quite right I think it actually it, it judging from uh, what I can see via Alice Obscura and, and other travel sites it's a, a change is happening across sort of demographic uh, uh, you know range um, so yes yeah, so you have these hyper informed travelers who want unique experiences but are taking road trips are traveling in the US and I think that makes a sweet spot and that sweet spot is the backyard wonder, which the US is rife in incredible places that are going overlooked. All of us, every single place, every single town has some incredible place, incredible story uh, that is being ignored or not celebrated in the way that it, it probably should be. I grabbed a few uh, along Route 66 because this is, was a, such a big part of this conference. Um, so this is, these are the, um, the guardian lions of Route 66. Uh, these are not in the same category as some of the other stuff because they sh only showed up. It's hard to say, it's all very mysterious, but sometime around 2011, these giant multi-ton marble lions appeared uh, one after the other along Route 66. And to this day, how they got there, who put them there, why they put them there is a total mystery. But they've sort of started to gain their own um, little culture, like people show up and uh, there are these log books and they copy them down and then uh, people will take pictures of the log books so that if one of the log books disappears, they'll recreate the log book that, uh, so that the next person has this kind of unbroken experience of, of these crazy garden lines. And it's just a, it's a very small example, but it's sort of one little magical place uh, in Amboy, California. Um, this is the Glen Rio ghost town that straddles the border of uh, New Mexico and Texas. And, you know, even though Glen Rio's population never was more than like a dozen, there were, all, you know, it spawned, because it was on Route 66, it spawned all of these motels and diners, and it had this whole beautiful little town. Uh, but once uh, Interstate 40 showed up, basically it slowly faded into nothing. And now it sits here, you know, completely uh, abandoned and sort of, uh, in this state of, of disrepair, but it's a um, beautiful example of this kind of glorious past of Route 66 that uh, a lot of people here want to preserve and celebrate, as do I. Um, another quick example is the uh, Twin Arrows uh, trading post. Um, so these are giant arrows are all that remain, basically, of what was a campground and a, a larger uh, site. Um, but and they're, they're basically, so what happened is um, these were built in the 1940s as the Canyon Padre Trading Post, and the store changed its name to Twin Arrows, inspired by the town of Two Guns, kind of trying to compete. The arrows were built. But again, uh, Interstate 40 sort of left these behind, and so this is all that remains in their sort of slight derelict state. And there are some particular complications with uh, preserving these. I don't know if there's someone here who's like super familiar with this site, but the ownership is complicated. But um, and then near, near here, sort of just, just next door, uh, this is Ella's Frontier Trading Post, which is uh, this abandoned trading post made from old telephone poles, speaking to kind of the, um, the unusual construction methods along Route 66. This is a, a good example of that. And it was owned by a former circus clown, taxidermist, sometimes poet, um, Frederick San Diego Rawson. And so it was built in 1927 and eventually sold to a Hawaiian band leader uh, and his wife, Ella Blackwell. They divorced, Ella got this, which is why it's Ella's Trading Post. She was a former Juilliard student. She uh, would play piano for travelers and then in later years sort of for mysterious non-corporeal -corpor travelers, you know, she would sort of go and, and play for um, imaginary people and, and animals. And then in her, since her death in 1984, it's been basically sitting here and slowly rotting away. And like. There is so much story in this building, like a, a former circus clown sold to Hawaiian band leader. Like, it may not be the most, uh, you know, it's not like you see this and you go, oh my God, this place is amazing. But once you understand its background, it sort of transforms and becomes a site that you would really 
want to go and experience. Uh, and I think that's true of a lot of places along Route 66 and a lot of the places that I'm talking about. It's, it takes kind of providing that context to really uh, create the experience of travel. I mean, that, and that is sort of what all of this is about. So I'm going to give you an example of a, a surprising uh, success story. So this is a place in Tonopah, Nevada. And it's been around uh, since the 90s, and for a very long time, it was basically just a small hotel, uh, you know, in this sort of last stop before you're in the desert um, uh, town of Tonopah, which is a cool town and has a bunch of interesting stuff in it. But no one really, you know, was like, yeah, it was just there. The people who knew about it were truckers and, and bikers. Um, and then something interesting happened, which is that in around 2010, sort of, the internet found this, including Alice Obscura, but it sort of, it almost like came up out of the, the ether, and everyone was like, hey, you know, there's a clown motel in Nevada. It has over 700 clowns in its, uh, in its lobby, and every room has a clown painting, and it's also next to an old miner's graveyard that's like made entirely out of wood and little, uh, metal plaques that are created with like nail and hammer. The graveyard is actually really in some ways more interesting than the clown motel. But people kind of started to lose their mind. Suddenly it was like, oh my god, there's a clown motel. And so an interesting thing happened. It wasn't just that the internet got excited and made, but you know, people started to make a pilgrimage to the clown motel. There's a whole video of like people making a pilgrimage to the clown motel. But suffice to say, tons of people, uh, made a special trip. They, it's four hours outside of Las Vegas, but people would drive the whole way, they would stay in Tonopah, they would stay at the Clown Motel, or they'd just take a selfie there and stay at the other, the Mitzpah, which is like the nicer but still haunted hotel. Uh, and it made a huge difference um, in sort of talking about the difference that a small amount of tourism can make to a town. You know, Tonopah is only uh, 2,500 people. So like that amount of tourism, people coming in to see, say they've been to the Clown Motel, uh, it makes a huge difference to all the other local businesses. And the only reason it happened is because this story got told. And it got told in a way that people could uh, really you know, get excited about it, had a, obviously a good hook. And, and I think the thing is not that the Clown Motel is so special, but that we can get better at telling stories that make people excited about, about the places that deserve to be uh, saved and celebrated. In a, and in the larger context of this is that this is happening in huge ways across travel. So um, this is Dark Hedges in Ireland. Uh, and Ireland is seeing its travel, its tourism, like explode in an insane way, largely because of Game of Thrones. Uh, you might notice that there's a Game of Thrones uh, type uh, person in this uh, photo. This is a traveler. It's almost like a it's a subset of tourism. It's like a kind of cosplay tourism. So people are going. They bring their outfits, or you can even like meet up with people who will give you outfits, and um, and they go to the dark hedges. So this has actually been a huge boon to Ireland's tourism. Game of Thrones obviously is about the biggest platform you can get, short of Star Wars, which is also in Ireland. So now they're sort of figuring out how to deal with um, the mass of people who want to go to Skellig Michael. And they're doing actually a pretty good job of, of managing this. So point being is that media, and obviously this is at the largest scale, but at a smaller scale like the Clown Hotel can have a real impact on actual travel, on the choices people make, on uh, the economies of, of these places. And even things that you might not think would have an effect have an effect, like uh, in Bruges, uh, increased the foot traffic to Bruges. Like, people saw the movie and they were like, yeah, Bruges. Like, okay, like, uh, it's kind of Bruges. So, you know, even stuff that you might not think um, would have an effect does. Because the way people make their choices about travel is, is not, it's about, um, it's about the story. It's about the things that sort of fill them with that, that sense of wonder and longing uh, and excitement. And, and those are both the things that what people, uh, plan their travel around and what they want to take away from their travel as well. And I, I just think these are worthwhile things to, to keep in mind. Um, so and for a second, I actually want to talk about, obviously, media can have both a good and bad effect. There is a dark side to the way that media uh, and travel can kind of intersect. So this is 
uh, in Barcelona, the uh, Sagrada Familia, and very popular site, beautiful Barcelona. Um, this is lovely Dubrovnik, Croatia, another incredible place. This is Venice, all beautiful, wonderful places, exotic locations, uh, except that they are terrible, terrible destinations to go to, for the most part. Tends a little bit on when you go there, but Venice has uh, 60,000 visitors come to Venice every day. Venice is tiny. That is more than the number of people who live in, in Venice. So the effect on the town has been like largely truly destructive. Like, and this is sort of one of the negative effects of like the media travel loop can get stuck in these cycles where people are like, oh yeah, like Venice, it's gonna be, so, how could I not go to Venice? And then they go and actually they have a terrible experience. It's bad for the place, it's bad for preservation because uh, it's very hard on the entire, like Venice is sinking into the water in part just because of, of all of this um, uh, constant traffic. Uh, you know, Barcelona gets 75, uh, 750 cruise ships disembark in Barcelona. People are getting upset. Like the, the, uh, the interaction between travelers and the locals is getting pretty uh, acrimonious. And it's, it's for, for fair reason. And some of these are, are failures of policy and failures in other ways, but this is sort of the, when, when media and travel gets broken, this is what it looks like I particular, this is, uh, Dubrovnik, where a walk through the old town center can take 40 minutes. That's like worse even than Times Square. It's, a, it, it's unbelievable sort of the, the, the negative effects that can have, uh, the, this kind of feedback loop can create. Um, and you can see the reactions here. I particularly like this sign. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, overcrowding and over-tourism are a genuine problem. They're an increasing problem that needs to be uh, dealt with. They're a problem for residents, and they create a particularly terrible experience for travelers. And nearly, the estimate is that two billion people are expected to travel internationally by 2030, uh, and with significantly more people traveling domestically. That's just an incredible movement of people. And I think what I'm trying to get at is that this can go well or it can go poorly, depending on the ways in which we engage people and the kinds of stories we tell and the kinds of places uh, we, we choose to talk about. Um, one last thing, it's slightly off topic, but I think it's, it's worth noting is that um, there's another consequence of all this international travel, and it's one that I think people don't love to think about, but obviously flights have a, a real impact on emissions, and, and so like last year there was a huge improvement in coal emissions, but a lot of those gains were canceled out uh, by international flights. And I think it's something people are sort of waking up to and it's, uh, people don't wanna grapple with it, but I will say, uh, if you take a efficient car, especially if you fill that car with people, that is four to five times more efficient than taking a flight. So road trips are actually not just a great American pastime, they are the environmental choice. So cram everyone into one car and hit the road, you can, you can feel good about yourself. If you've got a hybrid, you're like better than uh, a Greyhound bus, which, you know, I mean, a lot of things are better than a Greyhound bus, but, you know. Um, so this is, to sort of come back around, this is why the Blue Whale of Catoosa and the Clown Museum and other sites like this and Route 66 can save the world and why they're such an important part of the travel landscape. Um, sending people to these kinds of locations. The, the irony is, while well, Venice is being trampled into the ocean, uh, there are incredible locations all over the world that are slowly disappearing because there's not enough support, there's not enough people who care about them, there isn't the structure to help them uh, maintain in the world. And so by getting people out to places like the Blue Whale or, or other locations, you uh, not only, especially if you're road tripping, it's environmental, but, uh, but more than that, you're helping with tourist dispersal, you're helping spread that money around, um, and it's good, it's a better experience for the traveler. They get to have these great, weird, amazing, interesting experiences. I, I genuinely believe that um, the kinds of places that everyone here is interested in saving are important not just to be saved in and for themselves, but are important to help uh, create a diverse and interesting tourism landscape in the US and to help solve some of these other kinds of problems that are uh, arising. Um, and yeah, and like uh, from Alice Obscure's perspective, you might think, I think sometimes people are like, but aren't you just gonna create this problem at the blue whale? Isn't it gonna be filled with so many people that it gets destroyed? And it's like, 
yes, you have to be thoughtful about how you go about managing tourism. But 99 out of 100, I might even say 999 out of 1,000, the problem is that places are underloved, not loved to death. You know, And when things are being loved to death, there are things you can do, there are ways to manage it. But if something, if no one is there to save a place, then it just quietly slips away. And that's sort of uh, one of the great shames of the world. So, um, and I would say that I think there's an opportunity here because as I said, although international travel is sort of sexy and interesting, most people are still traveling domestically and millennial families in particular are making their decisions around locations, around, and they're, they're sort of uh, going to theme parks less and less and planning more around art museums and interesting, um, yeah, what do I have in here? Uh, museums and art, yeah, yeah. So di just different kinds of, of uh, destinations and particularly destinations that have that sort of unique and amazing appeal, which, which a lot of the stuff that everyone here is interested in, you know, roadside architecture is that thing. So I think there's a, a real opportunity to communicate uh, the value of traveling to these places and to tell these stories in a way that is gonna, um, excite people and get them to go there instead of, you know, Dubrovnik. Um, so now I'm gonna sort of get into um, the other part of this presentation and quickly, and you know, I, look, probably everyone here is, is well versed in all of this, so maybe, you know, but there, this is the sort of, you know, newsletters, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, Kickstarter, YouTube influencers, it's sort of the part of this that I think a lot of people who get into preservation it's like not the part people got in to be excited about, you know, like the media part is kind of like, oh, do I have to do a Facebook? Is that like a part of this? Um, yes, I think it is a part of it. And, and I think the, the reason is because attention is, is nearly as precious as money, uh, because attention is what can help transform a place, it can what help, uh, it's what can help keep it in the world. Um, this is, um, I believe that every preservation campaign should also be a media campaign. It should include uh, a, a real, um, plan of how, what story you want to tell, how you want to tell it, what platforms you're going to use. This is a, a place in uh, just outside of Detroit called Hamtramck Disneyland. It's an outsider art project, um, rather than a roadside architecture. But it was saved by, uh, by a, a great media campaign and a local arts organization that was able to come together, raise $100,000, and basically buy the house. And so now they, they uh, run this incredible place. And it would have been just as easy for it to be torn down and, and replaced with, with something else. Um, the other kind of piece of this is it's not about being a social media expert. Like sometimes I think this stuff comes across of like, it's all about like knowing every in and out of Facebook. And I think that's the wrong approach. The approach is that it's about finding your community. Um, this is Bat's Day at Disneyland. So it's like the goth day at Disneyland as a former goth I, uh, I you know, identify. Uh, and, you know, it's about finding the people who are gonna care and help you maintain the thing that you are there to, to maintain um, and figuring out, you know, who those people are and how you can best communicate with them. Um, so in terms of like real practical advice, um, I've already said this, but a great simple story, and I think it's, especially if you really know and really love a place, can be a little bit hard because you're kind of like, well, there's this, and then, then in, you know, 1942, this thing happened, and then 1970, you know, and that's great to, to know, but I think it's, it's important to figure out how you kind of make the elevator pitch version of your, your project, and, and that's like, uh, it can feel reductive, but I think it is important to be able to communicate why a place is important, and sometimes what that means is just figuring out um, what the simple narrative is, and, and you know, it, it has to be a little more than like, this place just should be saved. It's gotta, it's, it's helpful, I think, if it has a character. The character might be you and your sort of uh, process of discovery and like an awakening to the, the value of the location. It might be a historical character. It might be, you know, the, the, the um, circus clown who owned Ella's Frontier. Like, but to tell that story in a way that makes someone wanna tell someone else that story is a really powerful tool. Um, so figuring out how to kind of craft a simple story is important and it's what you can galvanize a community around. Uh, make a media spreadsheet. This seems like it's very basic, boring advice. I'm sure everyone is already on top of this, but I, I do feel like just figuring out uh, who you want to communicate with, whether it's a list of Instagrammers or local newspapers or radio, whatever it is, sort of really building out that and, and starting um, small and kind of going out, I think, you know, you can work your way up to national media, but like just figuring out who am I trying to talk to? 
uh, is a really important first step. So like building a great media spreadsheet is uh, a, nice, a nice way to begin. And then a landing page, once you've built your media, you've got your story, you've got your media spreadsheet, uh, you're able to get you know, uh, on, the, on the local news, um, sending people to a simple landing page with one major actionable item uh, is really helpful. You know, making it simple for people to get on board to help you, whether that's a you know, petition to, to save a place or you know, having people write letters to a local politician or whatever that action is, it's gonna depend on your particular campaign. But I think driving people to a simple landing page with an actual item is, is really essential because um, it's so easy to lose people sort of somewhere along that process and, and the more direct you make it, the better. Uh, I'm a very firm believer in this. It is better to have 100 true believers than 10,000 casual supporters. 100 true believers can move mountains. They can save a place. They're the people who will show up at the crack of dawn and you know raise their fist to the sky and, and help you um, save the location or, or, or do the work, the actual physical work that needs to be done, whatever. A hundred true believers is the most valuable thing, you know? Uh, 10,000 people who are kind of like, cool, is like doesn't get you anything ultimately when it comes down to it. They just, it's not as valuable. So I, I think it's really about focusing. When you think about your story and you think about your media campaign, it's how do I reach the people who are going to care the most and then how do I galvanize them to, to really get involved. Um, and again, I know a lot of people have already sort of, this is, this is um, old news, but I'm always shocked, you know, when I'm dealing with um, some of these places. It can be, I so desperately want these kinds of places to stay in the world, and sometimes uh, it's surprising that sort of people just, this, these are not things that are sort of natural to, for people. Um, so this is a kind of whole quick uh, list of things. Obviously, you know, there's a whole side of this of like your local politicians, who controls the ability to save this place. That's, you know, that is a side of this that I, um, I'm not gonna speak to because I know less about it. Um, but I think even from a media perspective, it's, you know, you can use your platforms to give the person who sort of holds the power over this place a chance to kind of like you know, oh uh, yeah, I saved that wonderful building, or there's ways to kind of um, use those platforms to, to nudge your local uh, elected official uh, into helping you. I, honey, honey works better at first, but then later vinegar works too. Uh, <laughs> I, this is my perspective, newsletters, um, they're slow to build, so it's kind of a slog, you're like just getting emails, and you can kind of feel like, oh, God, okay, I added like 12 more people, but over time, I think they're one of the most valuable channels. Uh, because newsletters, you don't have to keep acquiring those people. Like on Facebook or on other platforms, every time you try and communicate, you in a lot of ways have to reacquire your audience. Newsletters, that's not true. People open their email 12 days later, you know, uh, whereas if they didn't see the tweet, it's gone. Um, so I think newsletters are just one of the best media tools there is. Twitter can be super noisy. It's it's difficult to break through. I, I mean, I'm sure people are using it effectively, but I, I, I am less, I'm more skeptical of Twitter uh, in this particular environment. I think Instagram is like a huge boon to preservationists because it's such a visual medium. Um, and influencers are, are uh, even though it's kind of like an eye rolling term, uh, I think they can be a huge asset. Because oftentimes Insta, Insta, influencers, uh, especially on Instagram, are like, 24 year olds who just want to go do cool stuff. And if you're like, hey, do you want to go see this cool place? And I'll tell you about the history of it. I think you'd be surprised at how easy it is to work um, with like influencers on Instagram. I would skip Snapchat. It's a lot of work and hard to gain audience. Um, you have to make daily time. That's like a, just a piece of it. Don't worry about banning people. Ban away. If they're jerks twice, like it's fine. Uh, you know, try and do the stuff in this, in like your media projects, try and do stuff that you enjoy. So if you enjoy taking great photos on Instagram, make that part of your focus because if it's a real slog and you, you hate it, it's gonna be hard to do. Uh, it's not free. Like the, the, even though the platforms are kind of, they're, they're free, it takes time, it takes expertise, and um, oftentimes if you really want to gain audience, you, you can have to spend, especially on Facebook. 
Um, it's a place where it's particularly like pay to play. So it's worth thinking about if you have a budget and how you want to uh, spend it. It doesn't have to be huge. It can like the difference of twenty dollars on a Facebook post can make a big uh, impact. But um, and measure your results. Figure out what's working. Figure out where you're gaining traction, and then double down on on those things. Um, all of this is you know sort of intuitive. This is my favorite. Throw a party. It's like one of the things that Atlas does that galvanizes our community uh, most completely, and it's just creating um, a chance for people to, once you've got your 100 true believers, like get them in a place, get them drinks, hang out, talk about it. That will be the thing that knits everyone together and creates the, um, that core group that's gonna do the work that you need to do. So like throwing a party is one of the best possible things. This is Salvation Mountain in California, the letter night. Uh, and ultimately all of this stuff is just tools. They're all just, you know, None of them are necessary. You could run an incredible media preservation campaign and not use any of these things. You know, it's more about what your needs are, how you're gonna build that core community, and, um, and that's what's gonna determine what you should do. Uh, so, you know, basically the only major takeaways from this that I, I want people to think about are sort of creating that community and creating those stories and, you know, I, the reason I, I sort of harp on this like core community thing so much is that this is entirely what made Atlas Obscura possible. Like it would not exist without that group of people coming together and you know daily still sort of saying we're going to help build this. This is what we want this to be in the world. And I, yeah, I think that that um, figuring out how to tell your simple story and finding the community to amplify that is uh, is the core of all of this. So um, I'm gonna end with a final story. Um, and it's a story that I, I like to tell just because I feel like it, it encapsulates a, a idea that I think is important to me. So it, when I, a few years ago, I was traveling in, um, in South America. It's when I went to the Quechua Chaca in Peru. This is also in Peru. It's a place called Gacta Falls. And so it's in the Amazonas region of Peru. And uh, at the base of this large waterfall, there's this tiny town, Gacta. And for the longest time, uh, this had only just changed when we were there, for the longest time, Gacta didn't have roads, like good roads to it. It didn't have electricity. It was desperately in need of tourism and support from the government. Uh, and then in 2005, it just so happened that a German hiker was uh, going through the area. And he looked at this waterfall and he was like, huh, that is a very tall waterfall. I wonder how tall that is. So he went and asked and no one had measured it. They said, we, don't, we actually don't know how tall the waterfall is. So he came back next year, 2006, and he brought surveying equipment and he measured this waterfall. Also, that's the most German thing I can possibly imagine. <laughs> he was like, I will come back and measure and then we will know. Uh, so it turns out, um, by, depending on how you define it, but it, this is the third tallest waterfall in the world. And it was, this was discovered in 2006. Uh, and I went there in 2010, and part of the question that I wanted to answer was, you know, why hadn't this town sort of celebrated this, this thing that was right there, literally in their backyard? And, what the local said is basically, you know, we knew this place, we knew it was amazing, we knew it was interesting and, and beautiful, but like, you know, against all the other wonders in the world, how amazing was it? And eventually we just stopped noticing it. And I think that for me, the lesson is that all of us, wherever we are, live at the base of Gacta Falls. There is something in our own backyard that is wondrous and amazing, and maybe it's not so obviously wondrous and amazing, maybe it's Ella's trading post, but there's something incredible that deserves to be celebrated, deserves to have its story told, and deserves to be saved, preserved, and made uh, possible for generations to, to come and do the same. So that's, that's my presentation. Um, thank you so much for having me, and uh, happy to answer some questions. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, first question. Uh, 
Um, so I'm curious, podcast listenership has really risen in the past few years. Yeah. And so I was wondering if you had any theories or suggestions on how that could be used as a storytelling tool for a site. Maybe is there a podcast that covers some of the types of sites that are on Atlas Obscura or is there any merit in creating your your own, even if it's just a, a mini version or anything like that? I think there is merit in creating your own because it's a relatively low lift production wise. Like it, you know, you need some stuff, but it's not, um, it's something that someone can, can do themselves. Yeah. And I think there are, I, I'm trying to think of what the best, like bizarre States, which is out of California and part of like the Nerdist network. It covers a lot of like unusual sites, although not from a preservationist angle. They're like, they do a lot more like haunted stuff, which is like a whole other talk about it. anyway. Uh, um, uh, so, but yeah, almost certainly I think you could find, um, I mean, even something like All Things Considered is a potential outlet if you can kind of get access to the, the right producers and stuff, and that can be the challenge. But um, I totally agree. I didn't have podcasts on this list, but I think that's a, a really great, um, a really great way to tell stories about places. I think that's awesome. Yeah. And just a brief follow-up. In so the trends that you've seen in travel, are you seeing any similar trends in how people... Um, really respond to receiving those stories? Um, if you have a limited budget and you think, okay, so I could create an audio tour or I could do an interpretive panel, are you, are you seeing any sort of trends or preferences? Uh, about like what, which, where you're going to get your the best bang for your buck? Right, yeah. I mean, the rise of, of Instagram is no joke. Like, it is going to eat the world. Like, I think Facebook is... is um, is receding if for a bunch of complicated reasons. I mean, some of them are like very active right now, but like Facebook as a tool is losing some of its value. It's, it's gotten only harder and harder to get organic reach on Facebook, which used to be easier. You know, you could be a relatively small organization and like really, and they've made it more and more difficult. And you have to spend more and more against it to make it happen. Uh, Instagram, some of that's true, but I think there's an easier path to kind of building your community, communicating. And because Instagram is so visual, it feels to me if I had a campaign to run tomorrow, I would probably focus on Instagram and newsletters. Those would be my tools that feel like they would provide the most return. And and like, again, influencers, as much as it kind of can, it's slightly wince inducing, if you can get someone with 50,000 Instagram followers to come and do a tour of your location, that's a huge, that's a huge opportunity. And I think it's worth kind of like investigating for, for these kinds of campaigns. Thanks. Yeah. Um, kind of follow up to that, I was interested, have you seen a transition now with the advancement of augmented reality and virtual reality tours for either mass tour sites or these more obscure sites, how that's affecting your, you know, your, your readership to Atlas Obscura or just in general across tourism and the board, uh, across the board of a yeah. lot of the standpoint is, you know, for Venice is do a virtual tour and you don't have to go, but. And yeah, a downside to that too. I'm so I'm like a huge I'm like super excited about VR and AR and we did Atlas has a VR app that exists on the Gear VR headset. It's such a weird fractured market and like mostly it's still gamers and I think it's hard to get it in front of people. It's hard to do well. I think augmented reality has like a huge huge role to play but like 10 years from now, five years from now, maybe, depending. Like, I, th I think there are ways you could do really amazing things with um, with historical information and, and other uh, educational tools via augmented reality. But right now, I would say, like, putting money into VR, it's cool, but it's going to be really hard to get. It's just hard to get in front of people. It is just hard to get. You've either got to have the headset and put it on, or you got to like really be like, "Here's the cardboard and the, put your phone in." It's just, it's just a, it's a steep hill to climb. Still, I think that'll start to change over the next few years. But um, unless you have a specific uh, reason for doing it, 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 it's fun. I mean, so if you want to, there, there are like you could do it for that reason. But I think it's a tough, it's a tough way to gain a large audience right now. Thank you. Okay. I was just going to follow up on that. I just worked on a project with a uh, with Pulaski Heights Middle School uh, where they just did uh, augmented reality on a plane crash that took out several neighborhoods in Little Rock, but it was free. Uh, yeah. They were the ones that worked on it. And, you know, it's, it's getting history into the elementary school. 
uh, and have them sort of work on it in the background, plus they gain excitement about it. So working through uh, East Lab and, and different programs like that to be able to get that done is another uh, avenue to sort of approach in that situation. I, I know Google has a uh, education, like VR education uh, initiative where they're like getting cardboards into schools and providing sort of educational content. So, I, you know, it's not that there's no avenues, um, but I still, it, it does still feel like I would be interested to know what the viewership numbers on the AR uh, app is, or I'm not sure what the delivery method was, but um, yeah, I, it's super cool. I think in a couple of years, it'll become a much larger part of this conversation. There, there's been so much kind of written about like the death of retail and you know malls are dying and we need more Main Street communities and all of that. And I'm kind of curious how you see that intersecting with the tourism trends. You know, are those happening at the same time or what? How 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 how, how do those connect? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's part of the same um, shift in. Um, I don't even know what to quite the framework to put on it, but I think the desire for the authentic. Uh, which sometimes you have to put in quotes because it's kind of like, is it really authentic? Like a strip mall is also authentic, you know? Like, um, but, but the desire for sort of individual places that feel a part of their location is increasing both in kind of like the local and international sense. Like, you know, and, I, and again, I think part of it's just access to information. Like the rise of being able to sort of have a billion options and, and Yelp and Google and like, people are just more savvy and they want to do stuff and experience stuff that is feels real you know and i think um, i think as as retail like as the sort of all of the changes in big box retail that sort of starts to those the convenience of that starts to die because it's just more convenient you know that you see the rise of indie bookshops again like everyone talked about the death of of the indie bookshop but in fact it's sort of the middle players it's the barnes and nobles who are struggling and the indie shops are are doing really well, and so I think actually that kind of smaller local business is is poised for a real rise, and and, and that'll apply to both sort of uh, main streets and you know like international destinations. Yeah. Next question. I'm kind of curious of how you decide on what sites to put on your website. I noticed one slide you had almost 400. Um, sites uh, just in April so I'm kind of curious just how you process how many folks do you decide and that type of thing yeah yeah so um, it's it's uh, it's a little bit like you know it when you see it kind of thing it's uh, hard to define exactly but usually there's a great story something surprising sometimes it's more visually oriented sometimes it's more story oriented uh, but the way it works is basically we get this people submit stuff and it varies wildly in kind of completeness and quality. So it can be like two sentences and no photos or like a whole written up thing, a bunch of photos. And then we have an editorial team that just works on that part of the business, the, the places piece. So they fact check stuff, they make sure the photos are, you know, the right, you know, whether they're, maybe make sure that the person's, if the person is actually saying, yes, I took these photos, um, or we find a usable public domain or creative Commons share like photos. And so, um, so yeah, so we publish about, uh, 400 is it we just we're just creeping up to about 15,000 for the total database and we're publishing around 400 places a month that's about right it varies slightly but um, uh, yeah and the criteria are all over the place it's weird little museums it's outsider art it's roadside architecture it's a lot about telling stories I mean a lot of it just has to do is there a story to tell here that is people are gonna be excited about so I have a question sure um, Tell us a little more about your Atlas Obscura events, because I see that yeah. you have events that you post. Yeah, so we, um, there's sort of two things we do. Uh, the events piece is we have nine chapters around the country right now, soon to be more. But New York, uh, LA, DC, Philly, Chicago, Denver, Portland, Seattle, and somewhere else. <laughs> um, uh, Anyway, and so in these cities, it varies wildly, but like in LA, we run like 20 plus events a month. We put on a lot of events and there's a full-time person and a staff that just works on LA events. And those events are like the Alice Obscura Places. We go to um, a Santa Muerte uh, 
shrine where like sort of this new emergent uh, religious figure um, uh, is, is, is being celebrated or we take a tour of a great dam failure. So it's, it's all kinds of different stuff in terms of the events, but um, in Philly it's like we do like six events a month, you know, so it varies in kind of scale and scope, but the idea is to kind of put our money where our mouth is actually help people go experience these places. And if any of you have locations where you want to work with us on an event, we would, we would love to, to do that. Um, we're always looking for new, new places to take people. And the other part of it is we also now do these, these trips too. So we take you know, these uh, week or two week long trips to places all over the world, so. Okay, other questions? Um, thanks. Great, great talk. Very inspiring. Have you had any situations where the locals have said, "Please don't discover me"? Once in a while, yeah. There's a. What do you do in that case? We take so there's a there's like a few different levels. Um, we have the option, and sometimes we do this on our own end to delist it off the map. Like so, basically, it can it exists as information, but not geolocated and like without any instructions on how to get there, because the place is particularly fragile. Um, once in a while, we've had we had an interesting one. Uh, it was a little bit contentious. Some very, very wealthy people have a giant four-story, three-story, giant like metal bear with a lamp, and you can see it from a public road. And they wrote in saying like delist it because we don't want people like driving on the road, um, and that inspired a lot of internal debate about what. So we ended up looking up the the. We got settled because we looked up the designation of the road, and actually, they own the they like the road is not theirs, but it's someone else's. It's private, so we were like, okay, we'll we'll take it off. But it's a case, it's case by case. Um, it's pretty rare, um, but yeah, either we, if if we think it's like a bad idea to send people there, we'll just not add that information. And if someone says someone writes in and has a, a real reason to to take it off, we'll absolutely do that. So it's just sort of do no harm, you know, we have a kind of like do no harm uh, uh, philosophy. So, so following up then, uh, do, you, do you actually run metrics on what's been happening to a place as a result of listing? So this is the thing that we haven't done enough of. Um, I have a lot of anecdotal evidence. I talk to various locations and, and I have sort of, um, you know, that, but we have the, what we don't have yet is real hard foot traffic numbers. So besides sort of saying, how often do people come in and say Atlas Obscura, they, they got here because of Atlas Obscura, um, which we, we know for a number of sites. We don't have, it's hard data to collect. It's hard data to figure out, did they see it on the site? And then did they go there a year later? It's, it's a difficult problem to solve, but we're working on it. We really wanna figure out what the actual, even, even if it's just a handful of case studies, we really wanna get real solid numbers around that because it's, it's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Thanks, everybody. Really nice talking. And I'm, I'm around, so.